Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher, and welcome back to All About Canadian Books. If you missed my Get to Know segment, um, where we got to know author Bianca Marais, I will put a link down below in the description box so you can check out our interview and get to know Bianca a little better. But in this segment, we are going to get to know the story behind her best-selling novel, the Witches of Moonshine Manor. And I have read it and it is absolutely fantastic. I loved it, loved it, loved it. So Bianca, can't wait to learn more about the story behind it. Welcome back to All About Canadian Books. So it's so lovely to get to chat with you. Uh, so can, can I tell your, oh. your viewers a bit about it? I would absolutely love it if you did, Bianca. Right, so what we have is we have six witches who are in their 80s who um, have got the patriarchy coming for them as the patriarchy has always come for women. Uh, and they have Moonshine Manor and Distillery, which is their home and their business. And something has happened. They've fallen a bit behind on the payments. And so the townsmen are coming for them to you know, take away their, their home from them so that they can build something called men's world <laughs> on their land. Uh, and so these witches have got to fight back and they do so with the help of a 15 year old TikToker called Persephone, who is hell bent on bringing down the patriarchy, which she does with the help of her little um, Italian greyhound called Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The book has a talking crow called Widget in it. Uh, there's a lot of magic. It's fierce. It's feminist. It's quite a madcap romp of a book. Um, it straddles so many different genres, but I had an enormously good time writing it. And I hope that my readers will have a wonderful time reading it. I certainly had a wonderful time reading it. Now, Bianca, where did the idea for this concept originate? I always have character come to me first. I'm not someone who has a plot come to me first. I Characters manifest. And I had two characters come to me, Ruby and Ursula. Oh. And I knew that they were in their 80s. And I knew that one of them was having memory problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew that there was kind of a dysfunctional friendship um, going on, that there was more beneath the surface than just friendship. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to figure out how to tell the story in a non-depressing way. Because uh, I really wanted to write something lighthearted and fun and a lot more commercial than my first two novels. Mm -hmm. And then I saw a picture of a haunted manor and suddenly it all fell into place for me. I realized it was going to be an ensemble cast. It was going to be these witches who had been orphaned from very young, who had never gotten married, never had children and had grown up together. Um, and it was going to be an exploration of sisterhood. Yes. Okay. And within your book, I mean, you certainly do tackle a lot of serious issues, aging, you know, the power of sisterhood, identity, identity, patriarchy. Um, what role does feminine feminism play in your life? I mean, feminism plays a huge role in my life because as a woman, all that, you know, you want as a woman is to have equal opportunities um, and to be paid equally uh, and to be treated equally, you know, and something that frustrates me terribly is this misconception that if you are a feminist, it means you are a man hater. Uh, and that is something that I constantly, you know, rage against in terms of people's understanding of it, because I absolutely love the men in my life. I adore the men in my life, but I just want to be treated equally to them. Uh, and they would like the same for me. And that is all that feminism is. We, we are not saying that we are better than men. We are not saying we hate men. We are just saying, could we just get paid equally and treated equally, please? Yes. And that was one of the things I thought that was so wonderful, wonderful with Jezebel. Like she she loves men. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> Very much so. You know, uh, she's in her 80s and she has decided to age very sexually. You know, she has not believed this lie that women are told that, you know, when they get older, they are no longer attractive, that they no longer have 
anything to offer the world that they need to you know dress a certain way and just start knitting and baking etc you know Jezebel is just like hell no I have gotten more sexy and more powerful with age and I am going to take complete advantage of that and she does she she loves many many men <laughs> she does she's very busy <laughs> And that was, I mean, that was as a reader, one of the things that I loved about your book was, of course, all of the different personalities of the witches. You know, we've got Jezebel, who loves men. (laughs) And I just wondered for you developing these characters, of course, all of the witches have magical traits. How did you decide who was going to have what form of magic? Like that must have been so much fun. Yeah, so I looked at each of their personalities Mm -hmm. um, and chose the magical trait that would really go with that. So, for example, Queenie and Ivy are both very cerebral, analytical witches. They approach magic in a very scientific way in terms of, for them, magic is mastering and then bending the laws of science. You need to understand science in order to, you know, do magic. And so... Queenie is an inventor, you know, she is the uh, control freak Capricorn of the group, she's the one in charge, and so she invents a lot of things, because she's always trying to come up with things that will make the witches' lives easier, and so she invents, and Ivy, you know, she's covered in tattoos of plants, she has a beautiful conservatory, uh, and what she does is she uses elixirs and plant magic to make people better, to, you know, um, have longevity and all kinds of things. Then you have Jezebel who, you know, her magic is attraction. She has men and women, everybody very much attracted to her through her magic. Then you have Ursula who is psychic. Um, she is clairvoyant. Um, so, you know, she does the tarot cards, etc., etc. And you have Tabby who loves animals and therefore that is where her magic comes from it's in talking with animals in communing with animals etc so you know for me it was important that each witch be very fully formed as their own character that they would have strong traits that they would have things that they were very good at and then of course that they would have flaws linked to those particular qualities yes um which witch which witch (laughs) who do you identify the most with bianca It's funny you said witch, witch, because when (laughs) I write with every book I write, my husband gets to choose a word or a phrase that has to stay in the published novel. It has to make it through editing. For my first novel, he chose Orc, O-R-C, because he's obsessed with the Lord of the Rings. For my second novel, he chose the word Falula. And in this novel, he chose, he he picked a phrase and he said, it needs to be, which, which are you? Uh, And there is a point where somebody asks, which, which are you? Um, For me, I am very much a queenie. I am your Capricorn A-type control freak who struggles very much to ask people for help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Here we go. Um, one of the things I also really love, I mean, I keep saying one of the things, but I should keep, I keep numbering because there's so many, um, the wisdom that you can really hear in your character's voices. I mean, these are 80 year old women and you can hear that. Um, and I'm just going to read a little section here and I must apologize. I realize I didn't write who was saying this. They refer to life marching on and how nothing stays the same, you know, not mountains, not coastlines, and certainly not people. So the person who leaves is almost always not the same person who returns. And those who are left behind are just as eroded as those who go on. Uh, No one is left unscathed, even if they stayed in the same place aging gracefully is a bore um and i mean this is really wonderful sorry who i apologize who said that do you remember bianca uh i think jezebel said aging gracefully is a bore aging disgracefully um, yes is is something you know i I think that was jezebel i think the other one perhaps may have been ursula okay perfect and i was just thinking you know with this wisdom, do you think if you had written this book 
10 years earlier in your writing cycle, how different would it be? Oh, yeah, I would not have been able to write this book 10 years ago. You know, I often say that I write from a place of rage. Um, and no matter how fun or how funny my books are, they're always inspired by things that anger me about the world, about injustice, um, prejudice, etc. And something that really formed so much of this book is, you know, I, I am now 46 years old, almost 47. And what drives me you know, up the wall is how we are constantly being fed this lie that we lose something as we age. And we told this so much that I've actually got friends who on their birthdays are so depressed on their birthdays because it feels like every year they get older, they are losing something. Um, and that's such nonsense because we gain so much as we age in terms of our wisdom, in terms of our experience. We come into our own in ways that we were never like that when we were younger. You know, when you're younger, you're so insecure and you want to be like everybody else and there's the struggle. But as you age, you just, it's like exhaling into yourself and you just get more comfortable with yourself. And um, I was sick of seeing adverts about, you know, anti-aging serum and things to stop wrinkles and things that stop this and, and that and the next thing. And it just really infuriated me. And so I really wanted to write something that was a celebration of aging of, yes, we, you know, you, you may not be as vital as you once were. Maybe you have more wrinkles, et cetera, but that certainly does not mean that you have less to celebrate. Um, and, you know, it was kind of that rage that informed so much of the story for me. Yeah. And I'll just kind of segue into that rage. One of the things that really, as I was reading, like I've certainly celebrated my aging <laughs> as well in female friendships, but um, Jezebel and Persani, Personami were talking and Jezebel says that most of the school shootings are done by boys who blame everyone else for their problems but most of the people who starve or cut themselves are girls because we blame ourselves. And Bianca, I could not stop thinking about this, about this, this line. And I, I just thought, you know, I could see, wondered if when you were forming this story, were there certain key elements that you really wanted to convey to your readers about the world at large or did it kind of filter out organically when you were writing some readers have said Bianca do you have a checklist where you tick off every single thing you address because there's a lot in your books there is yeah but you know it's not that I said about to do that it's my characters inform me um how if they feel strongly about something it finds its way onto the page uh, you know, and that's something Jezebel feels strongly about. Jezebel has a rage room uh, and she's constantly throwing things and breaking things because she's just so angered by the world. Yeah. And, you know, that is something that when I was writing my second novel, If You Want to Make God Laugh, you know, there's a character in that who is um, raped when she is very young uh, and her whole life, she blames herself for that. And she punishes herself her entire life, estranging herself from her own life as, as she does, um, as she punishes herself. And I spoke to so many women in South Africa about this because two out of every three women in South Africa has been, um, has, has, sorry, let me just rephrase it. Two out of every three women in South Africa has had, some violence perpetrated against her, either sexual violence or, you know, domestic violence or something like that. And most of them blame themselves for it. And it's something that, that's one of the things that enraged me, that as women, these terrible things happen to us. And then we feed ourselves this poison of blaming ourselves, as opposed to blaming the perpetrators for what they did to us. And, um, you know, in so many of these school shootings, you see them. It is young men who are angry with the world and who express that anger outwards. And yet teenage girls take, they also have rage. They also are damaged. Yeah. They also 
experience those same emotions but instead of pushing them outwards what they do is they turn them inwards and they starve themselves and they cut themselves and all kinds of things and it's this kind of disparity between men and women and how they deal with these emotions that you know was was very much on my mind while I was writing because of course there were more shootings every every day there's another school shooting um and you know all of that kind of informed this book same as the capital riots were happening when I was writing this book. And again, you see mostly predominantly men running around with Viking hats uh, and guns, et cetera. And it does, it just it makes you look at, at the ways that we express our hurt and our anger and our rage. Yeah, I know. I'm like, I think I need a rage room. <laughs> um, we've kind of been certainly chatting about more of the the heavier issues, but it really was wrapped up beautifully in a very, very fun read. And it's certainly on a personal level as a middle aged woman, you know, it just made me feel like embrace, embrace where I'm at in life and just think of how great life can be with all these incredible female friendships that we have so thank you for that thank you crystal that's exactly that's what i wanted people to walk away from the book feeling you know because during covid what fascinated me was i used to do a lot of in-person book clubs and then that got cancelled and suddenly i was being contacted by so many book clubs with women who were in their 70s and 80s who were learning new technology purely so that they could maintain their sisterhood. They were doing their knitting circles, book clubs, whatever, through Zoom. And not one man I knew, not one man was meeting their male friends on Zoom to chat about sport or golf or any of these things. And so, you know, women always find ways mm -hmm. to maintain that sisterhood. Yeah, we rock. <laughs> we definitely rock. Bianca Mare, a great big thank you for being a guest on All About Canadian Books. I've absolutely loved chatting with you, learning more about your book. And viewers, I'll put links down below so you can purchase a copy of The Witches of Moonshire Manor. Thank you so much, Bianca. Thank you, Crystal. It's been an absolute joy. And any snoring you have heard in the background is my golden <laughs> retreat. <laughs> I didn't hear any snoring. Not at all. Don't worry. <laughs> Amazing. And, and I should really wish you a festive holiday season and all our viewers as well. Absolutely. I hope everyone has a wonderful December. We will. We will. And everyone, please come back in the new year because I have another fascinating author interview with Hesa and Ali Christensen, they are a fabulous mother duo, daughter writing duo. And oh my gosh, you're going to love hearing, hearing from them, getting to know them, and also the story behind their novel, Stealing John Hancock. It's an incredible thriller. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Bianca. Bye-bye. Thanks, Crystal. Bye.